So I already told you internet punks that the electric charge has to be quantized if a signal magnetic monopole exists in the universe. But you didn't believe me, so I spent my Friday afternoon going back to the paper. We're talking about 1931, we're talking about Paul Dirac. Let me tell you, here's some advice. You're given a good name like Paul, and you're a man, and uh, <laughs> everything's fine. Now, I can see why I'd be a little bit embarrassed about his middle names, because they were rather French, and he was a British gentleman. But uh, you don't start going by all three early initials, because that spells Pam. Anyway, we'll take Pam's word for it. Pam in 1931 presented this paper. This paper is described as one of the defining advances in quantum mechanics. This is about six years after quantum mechanics had kind of been established and um, he spends the first couple pages of the uh, seminal paper here talking about essentially rambling about electrons and positrons, protons and antiprotons, which hadn't really been experimentally verified, but he'd proposed them uh, theoretically and uh, blah, blah, blah. And then he comes out with this whammy of a sentence. He says H bar, which is Planck's constant divided by two pi times the speed of light over E squared is 137. Has something to do with alpha, right? But he's saying that is quantum quantized charge. He says that's what we know already. We've got quantized charge by that relationship right there. And here he sets out to uh, associate that with magnetic monopoles, the presence of them. So then uh, he spends, <clears throat> do you want to go to the punchline right away? No, let's not go to the punchline. But he spends four pages explaining that arbitrary ambiguities in the phase of wave functions are independent of the function and therefore depend on the nature of space in which the function exists itself. So here's this wave function, right? And it's got a phase, which he likes to describe. He's going to call this uh, phi naught or something, and then multiply it by some e to the i something, uh, I don't know, lambda or something. That's not what he called it, but that's a phase of the wave function. He's saying if you go around some space and then close it back up, then the, uh, the function itself can have any value, but the phase is dependent on the space that you enclosed. So it's telling you something about space itself the field of force in which the particle moves, and, uh, and that suggests something interesting about the, the nature of space itself. So um, things really begin to get nasty on page eight, and I'd like to explain to you, <laughs> what, here's one sentence that he wrote. He said, this is essentially just Weil's principle of gauge invariance in its modern form, and that freaked me out a little bit. I don't want you to panic, though. He begins to conclude that the flux here, the flux out of or into this space. Remember, we could have some source of electromagnetic field, which would then cause a net flux. Here we've got flux going out, here we've got flux going in, and here we've got flux going out again. So every one of these lines is actually leaving that space. Then he begins to say that the total flux is the change in phase during closed interval. So if you're, uh, uh, closed integral, if you're doing an integral around this surface, of course it's got to be a three-dimensional surface, then you could find the change in flux. But that's a problem. There's a contradiction here because we can have n times 2 pi, because there's something about going into, I don't know, some sinusoidal function or something. What he's saying is, if the, uh, if we would like to identify that as the case, we've got this ambiguity, which could be off by 2 pi or 4 pi or 6 pi or 28 pi or something, some multiple of 2 pi, which depends on what's inside this space. And then he, <clears throat> I mean, this is kind of a moment of panic because you say then that the integral of the, um, of the closed path around this space doesn't have any meaning, but it sort of does because it could be off by 2 pi, and you start to try to, <clears throat> I don't know, quantum is all about quantizing these things, breaking them into, this n is very, very important. But uh, what we're trying to do is we're trying, oh, excuse me. Problem is, now the integral can't be the flux from the electric magnetic field. So he introduces the concept of nodal lines, and I hope you've seen these before. A nodal line is a line where there's a zero in the electromagnetic field. No, not the electromagnetic field, in the wave function. So there's a wave function that he's trying to integrate along right here. And he was saying that the wave function doesn't affect the value, but now it sort of does. So this nodal line is the most important thing. If we've got this 
space that we're integrating around, a nodal line could be a place where there's a zero and it could go right through and we could have the nodal line go forever. And that's the normal case, I guess. So there's a zero right here, but what's really interesting, so this would just cancel out and that'd be fine, but what's really interesting is we have some space right here and we're integrating around it and there's a nodal line that ends inside it. That is a singularity in the electromagnetic field. So that could be a, uh, a magnetic monopole. That's the end point of a nodal line right there. If ends singularity. You probably like singularities because they represent uh, black holes, rips in the fabric of space time and stuff. But I'm not talking about that kind of singularity. I'm talking about something that is infinite. And I guess the magnetic field of a point magnetic pole is uh, infinite right there. And then, <clears throat> so that's really cool. What, what he's saying through all of this is that if an electron moves in the field of a magnetic monopole, which of course would extend through all of space, if one exists in nature, then it, its field extends through all space. If an electron moves through that field, its motion can only be described by a wave function. That would mean it's only real if that electron has quantized charge. That's his conclusion, that the charge of an electron may very well come from the presence of just a single magnetic monopole. Then he does a simple example, and on pages 10 through 12, his simple example, that's a three page example for those of you who are counting, his simple example presents this differential equation. This is one of my favorite differential equations, and um, you could find the general eigenvalue if you want to, but I just want to point out that we've got a couple um, partial derivatives, and then we're differentiating with respect to phi twice, and then there's also a differentiation with respect to phi once, and we have not just 1 over sine and sine and 1 over sine squared, but also i times the secant square and square of the tangent. And anyway, uh, <laughs> lambda some number. So that's cool. I thought that was a rather simple example. You should work through it. Oh, the solution is a separate paper by somebody else. So as he's finally concluding on page 13, Dirac says, here's Dirac's uh, concluding thoughts. He says, quantum mechanics does not really preclude magnetic monopoles. And so I'm gonna write, Mag monopoles okay with quantum. This is a big deal. That is okay. And then he says, one would be surprised if nature had made no use of it. <laughs> I love this perspective of physicists. They, discom they discover something cool in math and they say, probably real because it's so cool. So if there's this structure by which charge would be quantized, and by the way, we've seen quantized charges, etc., and uh, nature could make this happen, then nature's probably going to do it. You know, based on what I know about nature, it takes advantage of all the cool things that could possibly exist. He also makes a final celebration that says electricity and magnetism are now perfectly reciprocal. There's a reciprocity between them. And um, if you take, well, yeah, I don't need to go into that anymore for you guys. If you're watching this video and making any sense out of it, then you know that this guy can turn to that guy and that guy can turn to that guy in a very symmetric and beautiful way. And then he finally says, wait, why don't we see magnetic monopoles? So his proposal, and this looks like he was just tacking this on to the paper right before he mailed it in in 1931. Why are they missing? He said that the force between them, this is the attractive between, let's see, I'll put a couple E's in there for you, between magnetic monopoles is 4,692, you know, quick calculation, 0. 0.5 times that between a proton and an electron. So he's just saying you haven't pushed hard enough. That's why you haven't seen him, suckers. In summary, 
Wikipedia has it written like this in SI units, which are far preferable to the nasty units that Dirac was using. I'm just kidding. SI units are really inconvenient if you're a theoretical physicist, but I'm not a theoretical physicist, and I uh, become uncomfortable in strange units where C is 1 and stuff. But, uh, here, here's the argument presented by Wikipedia. Wikipedia says there is an electromagnetic field around a magnetic monopole, right? And classically, we have momentum density uh, from a pointing vector, right? And we have total angular momentum which is proportional to the charge of the electron and the charge of the magnetic monopole. And independent, oh, this is a big deal, and independent of separation. And then in quantum, right? In quantum, angular momentum is, of course, quantized. It's quantized in in wow quantized in units of h bar uh, so that means if angular momentum is quantized and if that and qm has some value, then we've got QE also quantized. It's really that easy. Because we know that angular momentum must be quantized, and we know that the angular momentum around some magnetic monopole would be the charge of any um, charges that are in there multiplied by the charge of any magnetic monopoles that are in there, uh, and um, maybe some constants multiplying right there. But that gives us this relationship. Let's do it in infrared, where we can conclude that the charge of the electric uh, charge multiplied by the charge of the magnetic monopole over epsilon naught times h times c squared is an integer. That's a win. For the win right there. It's usually presented as h bar with a 2 pi on top, but I think that's lame. Let's just cancel out the 2 pi.